As you're being seated, let me go ahead and introduce our speaker today. We have uh, Pastor uh, Colombo. He's a uh, teaching pastor and elder at uh, Bayou City Fellowship uh, here in Houston. And he graduated from our program here with a uh, master's in biblical and theological studies uh, in 2017. Uh, he and his wife, Megan, have four children and live here in southwest Houston. Uh, Chilobi's background is in finance, and he holds an MBA uh, in finance and practices full-time as a certified uh, CPA. He also serves on the boards of Hope International, 10,000 Villages, and Global Institute for Better Health. So uh, welcome, uh, Pastor Colombo. Made me sound way smarter than I really am, to be honest. Um, I have to thank my wife for writing that. I, I had prepared, <laughs> they asked me to do a brief synopsis of who I am, and I, I said two things. I said, I'm a glorified Uber driver for my kids. Um, and then I also am uh, pr learning how to uh, listen to my wife and not make mistakes. And um, clearly the latter is true because she corrected everything I wrote, so none of what I wrote actually appeared. And she everything was, <laughs> So I'm still learning how to not make mistakes. Uh, we, we, uh, we didn't get hit with the flooding. I was actually at our, our Spring Branch campus on Thursday when the flooding happened. Um, and uh, because I don't learn, and I always assume it would never happen to me, when the water started getting really, really high and I started seeing some cars, some smaller cars, uh, start getting stuck in the water. I said, well, I have a, a SUV. Let me go ahead and try to get out of Spring Branch. I've never been in Spring Branch when it floods. It turns into a river in Spring Branch. I don't know. Um, they should call it Spring Creek, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But I try to get out of Britmore and um, in, in our church parking lot, by the way. I'm there every Sunday in our church parking lot. So you would think if somebody knows um, the parking lot of our church, it w I would be one of the people. But in our church parking lot, um, when it floods, you can't really see how deep the water is. And I guess I hit some kind of ditch and the whole front of my Suburban just it happened in, in seconds. And before I knew it, there was water up to my knees uh, in, in an elevated Suburban. So I, I jumped out. Uh, we tried to push it out. We actually got, we did push out. Some, some, a, a guy, it's crazy, um, randomly just shows up with a truck, um, a gentleman. Um, shows up with a truck and just starts helping. You know, he, he put a chain on the, the back of the truck and he uh, pulled, pulled while a couple of us pushed and really the water was up to my, my chest. And it happened like that. It was literally within an hour. It was just crazy. Um, so the moral of the story is, I don't know what the moral of the story is, but I won't do it again. <laughs> and, and, I would not, and I would recommend that you guys don't do it again. Um, are we recording? We are, oh man, I feel bad for you. Uh, <laughs> Because I have a cold, and you're going to need that, that deep state uh, technology to kind of ma mask my, my voice because um, I, you know, we have four young kids. You got the joke, right? I appreciate that. Um, four young kids, and they're all under the age of eight. And when you have four young kids, you catch everything that they bring. Like, it's surface level for them, and you catch it. It just hits you. And so we had a, I, my, my, my youngest, Levi, had pneumonia a couple weeks ago, and um, then... Um, our second youngest, uh, who's only three, she had RSV, and so you just like, you know, you pick up. And so I don't know what it is I have. I don't know if it's contagious uh, or not. I hope not, because the next person who's going to have this mic, we will be able to find out if it's contagious or, <laughs> or, or, or not. But I hope it isn't. Um, but I'm going to try my best to not cough or not hack or make any weird noises while we go through this. Let's let's pray. Um, and let's see what God has for us this morning. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for, I thank you for the folks that are in here this morning. Um, I just pray, God, that you speak to all of us as we open your word together and you minister to those areas in our hearts that we need to hear from you. Uh, we ask and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 8, if you have your Bibles, John chapter 8. I'm going to go uh, through just a couple of verses in John chapter 8. I was hoping to go through all 59, actually not all 59, from 31 to 59. Um, and then because I ended up being stuck in Spring Branch, um, I had to protract uh, what, I was going to, what I was going to say this morning. But let's see what God has for us. John chapter 8. Um, the book of John really is um, a journey in Jesus' ministry as narrated by his close friend John. We, we know that. But John has a purpose for writing the book of John, right? And the purpose that he summarizes very, very well 
in verse 31 of chapter 20, he says, but these things were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing, you might have life in his name. So John's purpose is twofold. It's uh, apologetic, but it's also evangelistic. It's apologetic in the sense that John wants to prove without a doubt that Jesus is the Son of God, that he's the Messiah, and he's the Savior. But it's evangelistic in the sense that he wants the reader to believe. And it's in that believing that the reader has life in Jesus' name. Believing is such a big part of John's gospel that it appears, and you guys know this, about 98 times in the book of John, because he wants to hone in on this word believing, because he wants us to understand, the reader, to understand what believing in Jesus Christ truly looks like. John shows us that it's not simply paying lip service, an intellectual understanding of who Jesus is, but it is appropriating the work of God, the work of the cross into our lives. And so John systematically weaves the stories of belief and unbelief in the crowds as they discover who the Messiah is. And he takes us on a journey through first century Palestine that leads us eventually to the cross because it's on the cross where the who, the apologetic and the why, the evangelistic meet and collide and produce God's intended result. The purpose of the Father was for the Son to be lifted up so that he may draw all men to himself. John chapter 8 finds us in the temple. Jesus is on the temple mound and he's just spoken uh, to the, the masses and he's spoken about how he's the light uh, of the world. And the Bible tells us in verse 30 that many believe in Jesus. And so there's a crowd there because remember the Feast of the Tabernacle was probably just ended and so there's still a tabernacle sized uh, crowd in Jerusalem. So there's a quite a lot of people that are in Jerusalem and they all have varying opinions of who Jesus is. There are those who have believed what Jesus has to say, uh, but there are those who are actively pursuing to kill Jesus. There are those who are in, in antagonism with Jesus. There are those who are uh, skeptical or opposed to Jesus. So there are varying attitudes. And so Jesus is addressing this crowd of varying attitudes. Interesting, verse uh, 30 ends with, and so they believed. Um, but the question uh, that we need to ask ourselves is, what is it that they believed? Um, because many of you are familiar with the text, right? And, you, and you know, you've seen and read that throughout the text, at different points of the text, people believe in, in Jesus. Uh, but they believe in Jesus for their own various self-serving reasons. They all have their own version of who the Messiah, who the Christ is supposed to be. And they believe that specific version for themselves. When they need fed and Jesus feeds over 20,000 people, they believe. When they need a miracle and Jesus heals people, they believe. Uh, when they need to be enlightened and Jesus speaks with a certain level of authority that they've never heard, they uh, believe. When they think that Jesus is going to be this political Messiah that's going to relieve them of the bondage that they're suffering under Roman rule, they believe. But they all have their preconceived notions of who Jesus is and they believe Jesus based on what it is that they've established Jesus, or they want Jesus to be for them. That's not a problem that's unique to first century Jewish people. Problem. That's a people problem. That's uh, our problem. It is possible for you and I to believe in Jesus Christ, but we want to believe that Jesus serves the purposes that we would have for our lives. There's a Jesus of every kind of premonition that we have, right? That's what makes the gospel of health and wealth so appealing, because nobody wants to be poor. Everybody wants to be rich. Nobody wants to be sick and hack and have a cold. Everybody wants to be healthy. And so somebody's going to feed us the doctrine of you're going to be rich. Or the Are you covering your mouth because of me? No? Okay, all right. All right. Just making sure. Uh, nobody wants to, um, but if nobody wants to, if people want to believe that, um, and they just believe that because of what it is that they want to believe, there's, there's a Jesus, there's a version of the gospel that they can ascribe to that Jesus fulfills for them. So it's not a first century uh, Jewish problem. It is a people problem that you and I all have to experience. A lot of us have made Jesus to be a, a genie in a bottle that we can just rub and he conjures up some kind of miracle to satisfy what it is that we want him to be. But Jesus made it very, very clear that he's not a genie, he's a Lord. 
And he wants to be worshipped and he wants to be served and he wants us to believe. And he's laying out in the book of John what it is to believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus is going to get incredible pushback from the people because they don't like what it is that they hear because it goes against the very grain of what it is they have come to believe and come to be comfortable in believing. So let's open this text together, John chapter 8. Let's, let's start in verse 31 and see what God has to say. 31 and 32 says this, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus here creates a very, very interesting category. And I'll let you folks uh, in seminary explore that. We're not going to explore that today. But he creates a very, very interesting category. He creates a category of people who believe but have not yet truly become Jesus' disciple. That's a very, very interesting place uh, to be in, a place that I'm sure a lot of us would love to explore and, and, and dig deeper in. But, but this is a very, very unique category. It, it reminds me of the, the parable. You remember the parable of the sower in, in Matthew chapter 13? I think Matthew chapter 13. Jesus gives this parable and he talks about these four soils. He says, you know, a man goes out and he, 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 he scatters seed and some seed falls on the wayside or on the, on the, on the road and the birds come and they eat, eat some of that seed. Some, some seed um, falls on, on, on the soil, a little bit of good soil and, 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 and they, it, the, 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 it's received with, with joy and it sprouts up. Um, but the, the, the cares of this world or, uh, uh, cause that, that, that the plant to wither and the sun cause that, that plant to wither, and then there's a, a third type of seed that, that falls in, in, in decent soil, and, and Jesus explains it, says, you know, that kind of seed is a seed that kind of grows, but the, the, the thorns, which Jesus calls the, the, the cares of, of the world, choke out that seed from being able to produce uh, uh, fruit or being able to produce what it is that it's supposed to pr produce. And then there's a the fourth seed, which is a seed that then grows and produces fruit. I, I believe that Jesus is addressing that third type of soil, that soil in a, in a, with, a, with a thorny brush type believers, the, the people who receive the word of God, uh, but because of whatever it is in their lives, because of the cares of their life, that, 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 that the message, the word of God does not germinate and grow in their, their lives. I believe that uh, Jesus not only speaks to unbelievers, but he speaks to people like you and I. Let me talk about myself to me. Because I know there are very, very uh, uh, prevalent areas in, in my life where I have heard and I have received the seed of God in my life. But I'm not willing to clear out the thorns in my life to allow that seed of God to germinate and grow in my life. I don't know what it is. It might be an area of tithing. It might be an area of spiritual discipline, whatever that area is. But in our lives, there are areas in our lives where we know what the Word of God says. But we struggle with it because we don't want to give up that which we want to give up. I, I believe that that kind of faith, that kind of Christianity is, if I may be bold enough to say it, probably the most prevalent type of Christianity in, in our modern faith here in the Western world. <coughs> The church is chock full of people who ascribe a certain belief, pay lip service to a certain belief, uh, but life has become too busy to abide in the Word of God. Life has become too busy to, to discipline, to, to, to have those, the, those spiritual disciplines to abide, to pray, to study the Word of God. We're too busy taking kids to soccer practice. We're too busy trying to deal with our own mess in our lives. We, we know what it is. I mean, we can, we can answer a spiritual quiz with the best of them online. We can sound <coughs> spiritual. We know what it is that the Word of God says. But the cares of the world have choked out the fruit of God from being produced in our lives. And some of those people who grew up in the church end up applying to seminary, like me, still trying to understand and grapple and deal with the areas in my life that I need to clean out so that God can do a, a work in my life. But then, thinking I have it all together, I can go ahead and go to 
seminary, I can be equipped to then disseminate the truth of God in other people's lives before I've completely reconciled it in my, my own life. Churches full of people in the pulpits that have not yet reconciled the truth of God in their lives. What do you think the impact is with the parishioners that are sitting in the pews? You and I have an opportunity as we traverse through seminary to make sure that the word of God is reconciled in our lives before then we are tasked with that very solemn task of taking the truth of God to other people's lives. Because before we do that, we're going to have a form, but we're not going to have the power of God behind us. So Jesus addresses those type of people. What does it look like to really believe? If somebody were to ask me, I graduated in 2017, and um, if somebody were to ask me when I graduated from seminary um, what my seminary experience was, I'll tell them that my seminary experience was great. But I'll tell them that the biggest struggle in my seminary experience was not Greek. Uh, it was not the volumes of materials that we had to study, the books that we had to study, and the papers that we had to write. It was not sitting through lectures that I probably didn't understand as well as I needed to understand. But it was experiencing the transfer of the truth of God slowly shifting from here to here. Losing some of that truth of God that was sitting in here as my mind began to be expanded. But I didn't, I didn't make sure that I took care of what was in here. So it's important for you and I as we sit in these seats uh, to make sure that we take care of what's in here because it is possible to have an academic belief in the existence of Jesus because it makes sense. It's, it, it's an acceptable intellectual truth that Jesus Christ uh, is, is, is real. He, he, came on, he came on earth, he lived, he bled, and he, he died. It is possible to have that academic understanding and reconcile that ac academically, but miss out on experiencing the true nature of Jesus Christ because we've made it a pursuit of our minds instead of our hearts. I love seminary, man. I love DTS. I love what I learned in DTS. But I'll never look at the book of Job the same again. That was my dad's favorite book. Uh, I'll never look at the book of Esther the same again because, and that's, that's that my mother was named after um, Esther. I can't tell you how many times the, the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery ministered to me and ministered to people around me. But when we were preparing, going through the book of John at, and at, our, uh, at our church, we excluded that story. Why? Because it's a seminary. It's a seminary. I don't know. I loved it. I loved it. You gotta be prepared to guard your heart. So you don't, you don't move what God has deposited in here and just transfer it all up here. Jesus says the way we do that is we uh, abide with him. Uh, we come face to face with the transformative word of God. And when we're transformed by the truth of God, we experience release from the bondage of sin. Truth is found in God's word. It's not an academic truth, but it's a transformative truth. It's a sanctifying truth. And that's why Jesus says in John 17, 17, he says, sanctify them by your truth because your word is truth. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ therefore means that we take God's word and we, we abide in it. We, we, we walk in it. We appropriate God's word to our lives because there's a danger in not doing that. And watch what verse 33 says. It says this in verse 33. It says, they answered him. They said, we are Abraham's descendants. We have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say that we will be made free? They don't, they don't like the implications of what Jesus has to say. So they, they push back and they say, bondage, we've, what is bondage? We have never been in bondage. Now, never mind their history, right? Their history in Egypt their history with the Assyrians, their history with the Babylonians, never mind the fact that there's probably Roman soldiers standing around looking down on them right now. 
Never mind all of that. But you see, that's, that's not what the issue is. Yeah, that's a masking of what the issue is, but that's not what the issue is. The issue is that Jesus has dealt a death blow to a truth or an idea that they held near and dear. This idea that they were eternally safe with God. See, because they, they believed in their own eternal security with God through Abraham, through their lineage. Right? When, when Abraham, when God gives Abraham a, a, a promise in, in Genesis chapter 12, and he tells Abraham, and if you, if you leave this land and go to a land that I've, I've promised you, and if you, you, that I will, if you do that, I will make you a, a blessed nation. Nations will be blessed through you. I, I, will increase, I will increase your posterity. I will, everybody will be blessed through you. And so, so they, they held on to that promise because that promise, truth be told, didn't need them to do a whole lot. It just needed them to be in the lineage of who Abraham was, in, in, in Abraham's lineage. So it was easy. There was no, there was no implication for, their, for, for change in their own life. And so they assumed that the merit that Abraham received was passed on to his posterity, and his posterity did not have to do anything else. They could carry on their lives without consequences because their fate was eternally set. The the freedom had been purchased by Abraham's obedience to God and did not require them to be obedient to God. And Jesus delivers some bad news. He tells them that your heritage doesn't grant you freedom. I grant you freedom. Jesus grants you freedom. There's only one who grants freedom, only one who makes access to God possible, Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Falling back on the Abrahamic covenant was convenient because it absolved them of any responsibility. All they had to do was keep sight of that that promise that was promised to Abraham that they were going to receive. Uh, and if they did that, they wouldn't have to heed the warnings of the Mosaic Covenant. Deuteronomy chapter 28, right? The Mosaic Covenant, by the way, which they were, they were, they were suffering the consequences of, of, of disobedience, right? Blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28 real quick here. How much time do we have? Five minutes. Just real quick. Let me just read the latter part of Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28 says this. It's in my Bible, I promise. There it is. Verse 63 says, It shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing. And you shall be plucked from the land which you go to possess. Then the Lord will scatter you among all the peoples from the end of the earth and to the other. And there you shall serve other gods which neither you nor your fathers have known, wood and stone. And among those nations you shall find no rest, nor shall the sole of your foot have a rest in place. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes and anguish. So when he goes on and talks about the consequences of disobedience. And they're experiencing those consequences of disobedience. They experienced them in the previous um, bondage, and they're experiencing right now under Roman rule. But they don't want to focus on that. They want to focus on the Abrahamic covenant, because it doesn't require that they do anything. It just requires that they be part of the lineage of Abraham. Jesus exposes that errant theology, and they don't like that. Watch what Jesus says in verse 34. It says this. So Jesus answered, The most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, for, for, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free Indeed, Jesus explains to them that anyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. We are bound for what our, our, our affinities are. Whatever are the affinities that drive, that occupy our thoughts and our actions are what we are bound to, what we are enslaved to. And Jesus says your heritage isn't enough to break you free from that bondage. It wasn't for them. And it's not enough for us. Regardless of what our pedigree is, we still need the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us from our sin and to break us and break us out of the bondage of sin. And so Jesus makes a gracious invitation to them. He says, look, you are slaves to sin. I can make you children of God if you <coughs> believe in me. 
True freedom from the bondage of sin is found by believing and abiding in Jesus Christ. If the Son sets you free, you are free. Indeed, we're running out of time, so let me just close out with this. What does this mean for us, those of us who are in seminary? Uh, what it means for us is hopefully not all of us have it together. And so there's an opportunity for God to continue to do a work to mold us into the people that he would have us to be so we could serve the purposes that he has in our lives. And the reason that's important that we are molded into the people that God has us to be is because he has a purpose for our life. And our purpose is not in this building, but it is outside these walls. There are people who are walking around this earth thinking that they are right with God, but they are not. There are people that are sitting in the pews of our church who are convinced that they're going to heaven, but they're not. There are people who are standing up in the pulpits who believe that they're speaking the word of God with power, but they're not because they have not been reconciled to the person of Jesus Christ. You and I know this truth because it's right here in the book of John. So God has given us a mandate and a responsibility to make sure that you and I are first and foremost reconciled to God. So we can turn around and go to the world and speak and preach reconciliation to the world that needs Jesus. Jesus doesn't want people to be enslaved. Jesus wants people to be children. And he's given you and I an opportunity to partner with him in that endeavor. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this awesome opportunity that you've given us to partner with you. We are unworthy of that calling. Nonetheless, you've placed that on our lives. Lord, would you give us the grace that we need to be the people that you've called us to be? We ask and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.